George rose up in embarrassment. Never mind, my friends. A thousand friends wouldn't make up to me for my father. Do you know what I think? You're not taking enough care of yourself, but old age must be taken care of. I can't do without you in the business, you know that very well. But if the business is going to undermine your health, I'm ready to close it down tomorrow forever. And that won't do. We'll have to make a change in your way of living, but a radical change. You sit here in the dark, and in the sitting room, you would have plenty of light. You just take a bite of breakfast instead of properly giving up your strength. You sit by a closed window, and the air would be so good for you. No, father. I'll get the doctor to come, and we'll follow his orders. We'll change your room. You can move into the front room, and I'll move in here. You won't notice the change. All your things will be moved with you. But there's time for all that later. I'll put you to bed now for a little while. I'm sure you need to rest. Come, I'll help you to take off your things. You'll see I can do it. Or if you would rather go into the front room at once, you can lie down in my bed for the present. That would be the most sensible thing. George stood close beside his father, who had let his head with his unkempt white hair sink on his chest. George, said his father in a low voice, without moving. George knelt down at once beside his father. In the old man's weary face, he saw the pupils, over large, fixedly looking at him from the corners of the eyes. You have no friend in St. Petersburg. You've always been a leg puller, and you haven't even shrunk from pulling my leg. How could you have a friend out there? I can't believe it. Just think back a bit, father, said George, lifting his father from the chair and slipping off his dressing gown as he stood feebly enough. It'll soon be three years since my friend came to see us last. I remember that you used to not like him very much. At least twice I kept you from seeing him, although he was actually sitting with me in my room. I could quite well understand your dislike of him. My friend has his peculiarities. But then later, you got on with him very well. I was proud because you listened to him and nodded and asked him questions. If you think back, you're bound to remember. He used to tell us the most incredible stories of the Russian Revolution. For instance, when he was on a business trip to Kiev and ran into a riot, and saw a priest on a balcony who cut a broad cross in blood on the palm of his hand and held the hand up and appealed to the mob. You've told that story yourself once or twice since. Meanwhile, George had succeeded in lowering his father down again and carefully taking off the woolen drawers he wore over his linen underpants and his socks. The not particularly clean appearance of his underwear made him reproach himself for having been neglectful. It should have certainly been his duty to see that his father had clean changes of underwear. He had not yet explicitly discussed with his bride-to-be what arrangements should be made for his father in the future, for they had both of them silently taken it for granted that the old man would go on living alone in the old house. But now he made a quick, firm decision to take him into his own future establishment. It almost looked on closer inspection as if the care he meant to lavish there on his father might come too late. He carried his father to bed in his arms. It gave him a dreadful feeling to notice that while he took the few steps toward the bed, the old man on his breast was playing with his watch chain. He could not lay him down on the bed for a moment, so firmly did he hang on to the watch chain. But as soon as he was laid in bed, all seemed well. He covered himself up and even drew the blankets farther than usual over his shoulders. He looked up at George with a not unfriendly eye. You begin to remember my friend, don't you? asked George, giving him an encouraging nod. Am I well covered up now? asked his father, as if he were not able to see whether his feet were properly tucked in or not. So you find it snug in bed already, said George, and tucked the blankets more closely around him. Am I well covered up? 
asked the father once more, seeming to be strangely intent upon the answer. Don't worry, you're well covered up. No, cried his father, cutting short the answer, threw the blankets off with a strength that sent them all flying in a moment and sprang erect in bed. Only one hand lightly touched the ceiling to steady him. He wanted to cover me up. I know, my young sprig, but I'm far from being covered up yet. And even if this is the last strength I have, it's enough for you, too much for you. Of course I know your friend. He would have been a son after my own heart. That's why you've been playing him false all these years. Why else? Do you think I haven't been sorry for him? And that's why you had to lock yourself up in your office. The chief is busy, mustn't be disturbed just so that you could write your lying little letters to Russia. But thank goodness a father doesn't need to be taught how to see through his son. And now that you thought you'd got him down, so far down that you could have set your bottom on him and sit on him, and he wouldn't move, then my fine son makes up his mind to get married. George stared at the bogey conjured up by his father. His friend in St. Petersburg, whom his father suddenly knew too well, touched his imagination as never before. Lost in the vastness of Russia, he saw him. At the door of an empty, plundered warehouse, he saw him. Among the wreckage of his showcases, the slash remnants of his wares, the falling gas brackets, he was just standing up. Why did he have to go so far away? But attend to me, cried his father, said George almost distracted, ran toward the bed to take everything in, yet came to a stop halfway. Because she lifted up her skirts, his father began to flute. Because she lifted her skirts like this, the nasty creature, and mimicking her, he lifted his shirt so high that one could see the scar on his thigh from his war wound. Because she lifted her skirts like this and this, he made up to her. And in order to make free with her, undisturbed, you have disgraced your mother's memory, betrayed your friend, and stuck your father into bed so that he can't move. But he can move, or can't he? And he stood up quite unsupported and kicked his legs out. His insight made him radiant. George shrank into a corner as far away from his father as possible. A long time ago, he had firmly made up his mind to watch closely every least movement so that he should not be surprised by any indirect attack, a pounce from behind or above. At this moment, he recalled this long-forgotten resolve and forgot it again, like a man drawing a short thread through the eye of a needle. But your friend hasn't been betrayed after all, cried his father emphasizing the point with stabs of his forefinger. I had been representing him here on the spot. You comedian, George could not resist the retort, realized at once the harm done, and his eyes starting in at his head, bit his tongue back, only too late, for the pain made his knees give. Yes, of course, I've been playing a comedy. A comedy. That's a good expression. What other comfort was left to a poor old widower? Tell me, and while you're answering me, be you still my living son, what else was left to me in my back room, plagued by a disloyal staff, all to the marrow of my bones? My son strutting through the world, finishing off deals that I had prepared for him, bursting with triumph and glee and stalking away from his father with the closed face of a respectable businessman. Do you think I didn't love you, I from whom you are sprung? Now he'll lean forward, thought George. What if he topples and smashes himself? These words went hissing through his mind. His father leaned forward, but did not topple, since George did not come any nearer, as he had expected. He straightened himself again. Stay where you are. I don't need you. You think you have strength enough to come over here, and that you're only hanging back of your own accord. Don't be too sure. I am still much the stronger of us two. All by myself, I might have had to give way, 
but your mother has given me so much of her strength that I have established a fine connection with your friend, and I have your customers here in my pocket. He has pockets even in his shirt, said George to himself, and believed that with this remark he could make him an impossible figure for all the world. Only for a moment did he think so, since he kept on forgetting everything. Just take your bride on your arm and try getting in my way. I'll sweep her from your very side. You don't know how. George made a grimace of disbelief. His father only nodded, confirming the truth of his words, towards George's corner. How you amused me today, coming to ask me if you should tell your friend about your engagement. He knows it already, you stupid boy. He knows it all. I've been writing to him for you forgot to take my writing things away from me. That's why he hasn't been here for years. He knows everything a hundred times better than you do yourself. In his left hand, he crumples your letters unopened, while in his right hand, he holds up my letters to read through. In his enthusiasm, he waved his arm over his head. He knows everything a thousand times better, he cried. Ten thousand times, said George to make fun of his father, but in his very mouth the words turned into deadly earnest. For years I've been waiting for you to come with some question. Do you think I concern myself with anything else? Do you think I read my newspapers? Look! And he threw George a newspaper sheet, which he had somehow taken to bed with him, an old newspaper with a name entirely unknown to George. How long a time you've taken to grown up? Your mother had to die. She couldn't see the happy day. Your friend is going to pieces in Russia. Even three years ago, he was yellow enough to be thrown away. And as for me, you see what condition I'm in. You have eyes in your head for that. So you've been lying in wait for me, cried George. His father said pityingly, in an offhand manner. I suppose you wanted to say that sooner. But now it doesn't matter and in a louder voice. So now you know what else there was in the world besides yourself. Till now you've known only about yourself. An innocent child, yes, that you were. Truly, but still more truly, you have been a devilish human being. And therefore, take note, I sentence you now to death by drowning. George felt himself urged from the room the crash with which his father fell on the bed behind him was still in his ears as he fled. On the staircase, which he rushed down as if its steps were an inclined plane, he ran into his charwoman on her way up to do the morning cleaning of the room. Jesus, she cried, and covered her face with her apron, but he was already gone. Out of the front door he rushed, across the roadway, driven toward the water. Already he was grasping at the railings as a starving man clutches food. He swung himself over like the distinguished gymnast he had once been in his youth to his parents' pride. With weakening grip, he was still holding on when he spied between the railings a motor bus coming, which would easily cover the noise of his fall. Called in a low voice, Dear parents, I have always loved you all the same and let himself drop. At this moment, an unending stream of traffic was just going over the bridge.